Okay, so we will start our last lecture of the mini course about DGP conjectures about from from Zenia. From Zenia, uh, today the talk is about. She will give some. Sorry, the title. Let, let me read the title. Uh, RTPF RTF approach to the GGP conjectures. So the, the idea, if I understand, then you, you will give some ideas yeah. how to prove the, some cases or yeah. of the conjecture in the unitary case. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks. So. Um, yeah, I just want to say this is my last lecture. So thanks again very much for inviting me to be here. And you'd think that this would be the last time you hear of me, but no, there's more next week, apparently. Um, but um, yeah, so today I'm, I want to uh, briefly discuss uh, an approach to the GGP conjectures called the Relative Trace Formula, or RTF for short. Um, and practically, I will describe how this idea came about uh, and give the main steps of the proof uh, that was used for the unitary case. And then perhaps at the end, if we have some time, we can discuss what the state of the conjecture is now for the orthogonal case and where do we move on from here to like maybe more general groups. Cool. So, uh, in the first lecture, we spoke about Hegge's central value formula. So, So Hegge's central value formula related the automorphic period to the square of NL value, where we have fixed f a modular form. Phi f was a specific vector in the automorphic uh, lift of our modular form. We defined um, a period with respect to the standard torus, we integrated over that torus and we found a link with the square of the central L value of uh, the automorphic representation that is attached to our modular form. And the way we wrote down the proof for that, we saw that it's quite straightforward. You do a Mellin transform, you kind of bash it out and you do end up getting a direct relation between these two things. But then we wrote down Valspouget's formula. And that took any automorphic representation and any vector in such a representation, and then we attached an automorphic period uh, to T, which is any non-standard torus in GL2. And then we related that to, instead of having the square of an L, a central L value now, we had L one half of pi times L one half of pi twisted by the quadratic character, coming from uh, the choice of the torus that we have. Cool. And we said that this was much harder to prove. And the reason it was harder to prove was that there was no direct relation with the L value. Uh, when we wrote down the explicit formula here, we initially had some L value uh, that we could relate it to, and then perhaps we were attaching some extra correction factors. But here it's kind of hard to see directly how these two things are related. So, uh, Valls Pouget Valls Pouget's proof in 1985 um, was something like a direct approach. He used something um, called the Shimura correspondence. Um, but we won't talk about this type of proof today. Um, <clears throat> what uh, was interesting, well, obviously this theorem is very interesting and its proof, the first proof was very, very important because it showed that we can have results like that for much more general cases. However, Jacquet, a year later, in 1986, came about and realized that we can use an approach called uh, using a class of formulae called relative trace formula. Uh, sorry, can you repeat what's mean direct appro approach? 
Uh, I won't really talk about that now. I don't uh, exactly know. I haven't read the proof of Valtz Pouget's result. Okay. Uh, like Valtz Pouget's proof. I've only seen Jacquet's proof. Okay. Um, but apparently he used the Shimura correspondence. I don't oh, know exactly okay. how okay, okay. he used it, though. Um, cool. So, and why we're talking today about Jacquet's proof is that it generalizes very nicely to the general GGP conjecture. And the proof of the unitary case follows pretty much the recipe that Jacquet used to prove Valve Pouget's result, which is quite interesting because not only have we seen that a very nice, simple result to state generalizes not just to the torus but to a much bigger class of groups known as spherical groups, but the, the, the proof approach also generalizes, which is quite beautiful. So, um, what is a, the trace formula and how was it used? I'll, I'll try to give some ideas today, um, but I will be I will have to be quite imprecise due to the fact that if I was going to be precise, it would have to be a whole course by itself, probably more than three hours. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to kind of achieve this idea of giving you some uh, clues. So, um, the idea is that we can, maybe, I can give you some intuition before I move on, but practically, um, what do I mean by trace formula? Well, the idea is that you define some object, which is going to be some distribution. Okay, so you take a distribution. And then you can do two types of expansions on the distribution. You have a spectral expansion. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, um, so you, you do a spectral expansion on this distribution and you get a sum of period integrals. And then on the other side, you get a sum of something called orbital integrals. And this is called a geometric expansion. Now, we will attach such a distribution to things that are coming from places where we know direct uh, um, relations between automorphic periods and L values. Then we will also attach it to things where we want to prove such results. And the idea is that once you have expansions like that, you will compare one side of it coming from one thing with the other side of it, with the geometric side coming from the top thing, and you kind of will try to relate the, 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 the period integral side of things, because then you will get some correspondence with L values. Okay, so this is the very hand wavy um, way of explaining. S sorry, it. so when you say period integrals, you mean this kind of integrals? This, this kind of integrals, oh. yes. So automorphic period integrals. Yeah, yeah. So this is the idea. Um, so why does this also work for our unitary case? So the rankin selberg uh, period, P attached to GLN, um, it satisfies something like P of GLN of phi is equal to LS one half PK times a product of things not in S, some alpha Vs, where this PK is an automorphic representation of GLN times GLN plus one. So we kind of see that again. On the GLN side of our unitary conjecture, we do get some relation between the period integral and um, our central L value. 
but on the unitary side of it, we kind of want to relate the unitary period with this central L value, uh, plus some other things, but perhaps we don't know how to directly do that. Uh, why I'm saying that this is true, this is a theorem due, one second, uh, due to uh, Jacquet, um, Piatetsky's uh, Shapiro, and Shalaika. Uh, Laika in 1983. Cool. So this was even before vals Puget's proof. We had a result that um, kind of looked like uh, a Hecke's central value formula. Yes. What was the question? Ah, yes. Uh, in this parallel that you are doing between the general two case and this more general case, in this more general case, kind of the, the place, the role played by the torus will be GLN, mm -hmm. and the role played by GL2 will be GLN cross GLN minus 1. Yes, um, yeah, just to but uh, that, that was the idea that we described on Tuesday when we spoke about, when we defined the conjecture, because yeah. the conjecture was practically, you have an automorphic period integral attached to the unitary group of dimension N, which you view as a subgroup of un times un plus one. And then you wanted to relate this to the central L value where pk now was pn tensored pn plus one. pn came from some unitary base change of some, uh, some sorry, some endoscoping factorial transfer from of the un and then the n plus one came from some transfer of the uh, UN plus one component, the rep that representation. So this is why we have, we care about this analog, because the L value that appeared in our um, conjecture was not attached directly to the unitary group, but we had to do some factorial lifts. Any more questions? So, so there's no conjectures for Spherical curve, you say? Sorry? A spherical curve. Yeah. Spherical curve. Yeah. Spherical curve. 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 Spherical kind of like Pauls Puget's formula mm -hmm. for the unitary case. Uh, uh, you also have that, for example, for the special orthogonal case. And you have more general uh, GGP conjectures, uh, but we'll talk about that uh, later, maybe. Let's uh, dive into the proof a little bit now. Um, OK. Um, OK, so this, um, I don't expect you to have understood uh, everything that I've said, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it was just an intuition, like hoping to give you some intuition before I go on to um, write down explicitly, again in quotation marks, the uh, relative trace formula. All right. So keeping all that in, in the back of your head, we can kind of try to explain what the relative trace formula is. OK. So, oops. All right. So fix. Uh, number field K just for the rest of the talk um, and a linear algebraic group G over K as we usually do. Now, we study the space L2 of the automorphic quotient of our group G as we have been doing since um, Tuesday, I guess. Yeah, the first lecture did not uh, consider general uh, groups. All right, so we study this space. Now, this space has a G of the Adele's structure, as we described on Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> Uh, 
since G of the Adele's acts by right translation. Right, so now um, we will consider the heck action. of the compactly supported functions on G of the Adele's. Again, if at some point I drop the K, you know what I mean. Uh, I realized earlier that I kept doing it um, in the past few lectures, so just correct that in your notes. Um, all right, so <clears throat> take F in the compactly supported functions. Take phi in L2 of G and define rf phi of x as the integral over g of the adels of fy times phi xy dy. Cool. So, at this point I'm just going to state the fact that I will not consider convergence issues at any point. We will not address this today because integrals are going to keep appearing. Um, so, yeah, just believe me, I guess. Um, and I will also not really talk about what kind of um, measures we're talking about. All right. So, this is an integral operator, and it satisfies the following. Um, we can just look at it as G A of the Adele's F X minus 1 Y phi Y dy. All right, so now um, I'm going to start doing some explicit computations on this to see when the kernel of this, how the kernel of this operator appears inside um, this expansion. All right, so this, I'll just write equal meaning, this. Okay, so now this is equal to, we can instead sum over the automorphic quotient. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then we just take representatives uh, for g of k, and then we just have x minus 1, y, uh, gamma, y, phi, y, dy. All right, so we, we set this thing here to be equal to k, f, x, y, and we call it the kernel of the integral operator. R. Cool. All right, so um, now recall that we have the Peterson inner product, which we denote by these brackets. Which has we have been using that since uh, last week, actually. It kept appearing. Oh, I've deleted. Never mind. All right, um, so consider the Peterson inner product. Now, I will write something that is not really true. Um, phi, we can decompose it as a sum over pi, where pi runs over all the irreducible automorphic representations of G, sum over elements C in OB of pi, where OB of pi is some orthonormal basis for pi. And then I write phi as Peterson inner product of phi with psi um, times psi. Now, this is not really true because you have to take care of the non-discrete part of this thing here. But for today, let's consider this as an accurate equality. Um, practically, I am ignoring some extra terms that should appear here. Um, 
but it doesn't really hurt to think of it this way for today. Is exothermy should be integral or some integral? Yes. This is a continuous part of this? Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, this is important, but since, um, yeah, let's, let's just think of it this way today. Practically, when I write down more explicit formulas, you'll practically see that there are some extra terms that should be appearing, that should come from the extra terms of this expansion that we're writing for our automorphic form. But, um, yeah, we, sh we have to do some simplify, we have to make some simplifications to explain the relative trace formula in a reasonable amount of time. So, yeah. Yes. I guess maybe one of the phi's in the in the bracket should be a psi. Yeah, it, <laughs> it is, but it doesn't look like it. So. Oh, is it? it... <laughs> I'm just not watching on a good enough screen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, also, yeah. If the handwriting is not clear, let me know. Um, uh, thank you, Chris. All right. So now let's let's expand this using this. Right. So we have that R F of phi of x. It was an integral over K F x y phi y dy right so now we write we instead are going to write this as sum pi sum see I'm, i won't keep writing this you can just the first sum will always be ir irreducible automorphic representation of g this will be running over some orthonormal basis of our representation okay so we'll write this as Phi C R F C X. This C is very ugly. Let's write it again. Okay, very good. Um, just bear with me for one second while I write down some formulas. Right, so what have I done here? I've just expanded the Peterson inner product. And finally, um, oh, sorry, I'm confused about the second one, equality. Yeah, this is just practically, you can think of it as notation. Uh, but practically, we're just looking at the eigenspace of this operator. And we can denote it by this. Okay. All right. So the second inequality is just a notation. Uh, you, you can think of it as just okay. notation. It's practically just notation. Um, all right. So I can um, now. I'm going to start moving sums and integrals around, which again needs justification. It practically comes from Fubini's theorem, but I'm not going to state Fubini's theorem now. It needs quite a little bit of measure theory to understand what is going on. So again, by faith. We can swap things around. Um, All right, so here the Peterson inner product needs this. I forgot to write it. And now what have I done here? I've swapped the integrals around, and I've kind of like manipulated, mashed things together so that it looks a little bit nicer. All this, you can actually prove it. It's uh, not too hard. All right, and now 
this inner thing we will just denote it by um, so th this thing here is some pi some c pi f c x c y bar right so this we will denote it by k f pi <coughs> of x comma y so this thing is just sum of pi k phi pi x comma y and you can probably kind of already see why I'm, I've written it like that because if you compare it with this thing here this practically tells me that this sum here is actually equal to the kernel of the operator so I've practically shown that the kernel of the operator also has an expansion running over all the reducible automorphic representations of uh, our form. Is this clear? Okay. Um, right. And this is what it's called. The spectral expansion of the kernel. And if you remember from the intuition I tried to give you at the very beginning, one side of something that we would expand would be a spectral expansion. The other one would be a geometric expansion. So this kind of should tell you that I'm going to now define some object and I'm going to use this expansion, which is known as a spectral expansion. I, you're all confused because there shouldn't be a pi here. Um, I hope I haven't made any typos, but um, other than that. All right, any questions about the spectral expansion? This was very confused. Okay, um, I shouldn't have deleted this then. Right, so we, we, we initially expanded this operator here, and we wrote it as an integral over the automorphic uh, quotient of the kernel kf x y times phi of y dy. Then we looked at this integral operator and we used the expansion using the Peterson inner product and the orthonormal basis of r phi. We, we did some calculations and we ended up seeing that we can write this r f phi of x as an integral over the automorphic quotient of something times phi of y, and this something now is a sum over all the irreducible automorphic representations, sum over specific vectors in the orthonormal basis, and then we have this thing here. Yeah. Cool. Now, this thing here has to be equal to this, because these two are the oh, same thing. I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay, see. We're, we're expanding the exact same thing here. So you, you get an, an equality of kernel of something. Ex exactly. Okay, so, okay, so, so we found two different ways of writing the coefficients that appear here. One is just a kernel and the other one is this. If I just denote the middle part by kf comma pi, because it is practically a kernel, then I can see that I have an expansion of my kernel in terms of running over all of the morphic representations now. And this is what we call a spectral expansion of the kernel. Cool. All right. Um, can I erase this side? OK. Um, I've promised notes, and you'll see notes. So don't, don't worry too much about writing everything down. Um, That's good to write. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm just. Uh, Okay, so the goal and then oh, so the output is to write, write the, the kernel, kernel in terms of sum of kernel, kernel over all the, 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 the,
What do you mean? Multiplicity because in this effect. Well, well, I. I Oh, you're counting by multiplicities in this cell. Exactly. Oh, okay, I see. Exactly. Um, All right. Um, do, 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 do. So now I will write down what the relative trace formula is for a general setting. And then we're going to see for which particular settings we're going to have to apply the relative trace formula because as I said initially we're going to have a formula and we're going to input two different things and look at two different formulae and then compare it. So first we need the general setting. All right, so consider two subgroups H1 of G, H2 of G. All right, and take some quadratic character as well. Um, from the automorphic uh, quotient of H2 to C cross. All right, so all these are fixed. Right, so now define again for F in the compactly supported functions on G of R Adels over the number field that we fixed at the very beginning of the lecture. Um, Yes, um, I had a mistake here. Uh, all right, so now define a distribution, as I promised. So this distribution is going to be an integral over H1, the automorphic one, uh, the automorphic quotient, times H2, so it's a double integral, of the kernel of F, H1, comma H2. So now I look at the kernel running over one subgroup and over another one, times eta of H2, where eta is the character that I fixed, dH1, dH2. Now, because I have defined this distribution using this kernel, we know that this kernel has a spectral expansion, which means that I can apply a, a, a sort of spectral expansion on this thing. So this is just H1, H2, K, F, pi, H1, H2, eta, H2, DH1, DH2. And I haven't done anything here. I've just used that spectral expansion. Again, the pi run over irreducible automorphic representation, blah, blah, blah. All right. Now... Again, by Fubini's theorem, um, uh, you, you have that you can swap the sum and the integral. So we get sum integral k f pi h1 h2 eta h2 d h1 d h2 pi and then here the integral is as before. All right. So. This is the spectral expansion of our um, do, 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 of our distribution, and we have that i of f is equal to sum pi integral k phi pi h1 h2 dh1 dh2. It doesn't hurt to denote this thing here by something, as we've been doing so far, we'll just denote it by i pi f. So now our distribution is a sum over some local distributions. Local, not in the correct way. I, I sh maybe I shouldn't have said that. Some distributions that uh, run over automorphic, uh, ir ir irreducible automorphic representations of our group. All right. <clears throat> So now we can do the same kind of expansion um, that we did for our kernel here. Why? Because we, we know how to write this down explicitly. So just by, by, by the definition of uh, the, the factors of the kernel, we just have that this thing here is equal to the integral h1 times h2 
sum by f <coughs> c h1 c h2 bar eta h2 dh1 dh2 just by the definition of this object here and now again we can just do some manipulations here uh, swapping sums integral and and breaking down the integrals now we will get an integral over h1 of pi f c h1 dh1 and an integral over h2 of c h2 bar eta h2 dh2 and now we see why we care about objects like that because the automorphic periods appear here right because this thing here is just the automorphic period over H1 of PF C C. And this here is just what we had denoted in our last lecture, H2 comma eta, because we were twisting by a character. But here um, of C, but here you need this. You need to take bar because the way we defined this was eta bar was appearing, so you need to swap these two now. So suddenly we have that our distribution can be written as a sum over pi of the automorphic periods that we actually care about interpolating. And this is what is known as the spectral expansion of our distribution. The spectral side of the story. All right, are there any questions? I know it's a lot to take in, so um, think about it for a second. Um, so um, we have defined the distribution in a specific way, and we have, bash, uh, we have found a way to write down uh, a spectral expansion. And now, as I promised, there is a geometric expansion of this object here. Right, so IF has a geometric expansion as well. Geometric expansion. Right, so where is the geometry coming from? The group <coughs> H1, H2, it acts on G via H1, H2. Gamma is just H1 minus 1, gamma H2. Very standard stuff. You just take two subgroups, you define the action to be this. All right, so now we will denote by H1, comma H2, gamma, the centralizer, the stabilizer, sorry, of this action. And just for completion, let's just write what this is. It's just elements such that h1 to the minus 1 gamma h2 fix gamma. All right. We denote this by this. All right. So now, we define the distribution to be an integral kf h1 h2 eta h2 dh1 dh2. This is equal to the 
this is this is the same as considering um, the integral over um, the exact same thing, but now I will look at the representatives. Um, for the action. And now I can write this as Or was I? Yeah. And now I can write this as sum over y in h1 of k, g, k, h2, k of my integral h1 times h2 over the adult mod h1, h2, gamma now, uh, k, f, h minus 1, gamma, h2, eta, h2, dh1, dh2. And now, um, Practically, one can observe, it's a very easy computation, that things that are in the same coset here um, give you the same function. So instead, you can just write this as gamma in H1, K, G, K, H2, K. And then you take the volume out of H1, H2, sorry. gamma, the automorphic one, and then you integrate over h1, h2 of the Adels modulo the stabilizer again at the Adels, because as I just said, the, the things um, that belong to the same coset give you the exact same thing, so you can just times it by the volume. Okay, and now this thing is what we call an orbital integral. And we denote it by O gamma comma F. So now this, our distribution, your IF, is a sum over elements of this coset. G, K. H2K uh, of orbital integrals. Oops, times the volume. I forgot that. Vol and this is called the geometric expansion. So finally, we can write down explicitly what the relative trace formula is. So the relative trace formula for um, G, which has two subgroups, H1 and H2. This is just a sum over pi um, C, P H1 of pi F C, P H2 comma eta of, what was it? C bar 
and this is now equal to sum pi the volume times the orbital integral. So the left hand side is the spectral expansion, the right hand side is the geometric expansion. Great. Um, as I said before, because here this doesn't take care of the continuous spectrum, you do end up getting some extra factors here. This is not a very precise identity, but it just gives you the idea of what we're trying to do when we're using formulae like this. Um, so this is um, this is the flicker Rallis uh, uh, relative trace formula, and it stemmed from the work of Zake, who in eighty six proved uh, Valspuget's result. using some trace formula, and then Jacquet and Rallis proposed the, regular, uh, the relative trace formula approach to the GGP conjectures. You need to take quotient in the first line integral. Um, uh, the first line integral, you need to take quotient. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Was it maybe something I deleted? <laughs> oh, OK. All right. You said you're confused. Yes. I'm confused. Oh, I'm confused. If, but, but because you proved this equality, no, you you get you get some spectral side. Okay, but and I, now I you didn't really prove it because it's not like the expansion here has issues. Like the, 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 this. Remember when I wrote down our phi as some some like this. You can't just do that and sum over all the irreducible automorphic representations of your spe you forget stuff from the spectrum. Is what we discussed at the very beginning. So I didn't yeah. really prove it. No, yeah, yeah. See, I, 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 I accept accepting oh, right. that yes. you did two kind of calculations. Yes. One was the spectral side, and secondly, this geometric exp exp expansion. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the same object. So this equality, you already assuming this stuff, you prove it. Yes. And that is called the relative trace formula in, in this case. For this, yes. OK. And now we will see how we can use that to uh, prove GGP. OK. And this, you say, is proved by Frickett and Rallis following these ideas? For, for uh, the case that we care about is the Flicker and Rallis relative trace formula. But um, it follows ideas of Jacquet, who used a relative trace formula for valve mm -hmm. groups and proved valve theorem. And then Jacquet and Rallis put up a paper where they explained how to use a specific relative trace formula yeah. um, for the GGP conjectures. But I think the most general relative trace formula for uh, spherical groups is from Flicker and Rallis. Uh, and in which is the uh, year more or less this? Mm? Which year more or less was obtained? The, the, this approach. Um, this is equality, yeah? Ah. Uh, looks. I, I don't I don't I don't know. I don't want to say something that's wrong. Oh, more or less? Or it was 90s? probably in the 90s, 80s? I have no, oh, to okay. assume, but I, I, I don't know. I might be way oh, off. Yeah. Because um, trace formulae are very like. Like the Poisson summation formula is a trace formula. Uh, if you plug in the correct groups, I think uh, Z and R, you, you get the Poisson summation formula for specific functions. Uh, so this is not something that was proved by like specific people. It was proved by specific people for specific cases by expanding correctly uh, the spectrum of L2. Right, so now 
we will we see that we have a formula that relates the, which on one side has automorphic period integrals, which is what we care about. Okay, so we will define one trace formula for the GGP pair with the unitary groups so that the unitary um, stuff appear here and then we'll define another one from, which comes from the general linear stuff so that the periods of, the, of GLN appear here because the periods of GLN we have from Jacquet, uh, Pietzik, Shapiro and Shalaika, we have a formula that equates those things with the L values that we care about. And then we're going to compare the two relative trace formulas. I think I need at least 20 more minutes, is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Of time. Maybe not 20, but we'll see. Um, you have no problem with uh, Zoom? No okay. We <laughs> um, have time, so it's perfect. If you go online, people don't have time in the next 10 minutes, um, you'll get the main ideas and you can leave, I guess. Um, all right, so we consider two types of relative trace formula. Okay, the first one is we take G to be U V N times U no I had W last time. Doesn't matter, you know what I'm talking about. I think I think I think I had this. WN yeah. W N. Yeah, and then we take H one equal to H two equal to H which is W N, diagonally embedded, as usual. All right. Now, the relative trace formula tells you that you consider all representations and you practically get P H. All right, so this was one relative trace formula. The second one that we consider, we will take G prime to be equal to GLN K times GLN. Oh, and here we take trivial character. Remember in the trace formula character appears, we just take it trivial so that it doesn't do anything. GLN plus one K, and then we look at H1 inside of this, which is going to be GLN K, and then H2 inside here, which is GLN, let's say over Q, times GLN plus 1 over Q. All right, and now the character will be eta. Um, yes, so let me write this and I will explain uh, what is going on. I, I forgot to tell you. Um, All right, and then Oh, sorry to ask you again. So you, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll fix all that. Um, because I just, you're right, I did take K initially to just be a number field. All right, um, one second. Um, let me write down the formulae and then we can fix them and discuss them. Um, Okay, so k was a number field. Let's take k over f for some f uh, smaller than this quadratic. And now let's consider this delta here to be h f g f h f, same as the gamma here. G prime F H two F and now you made a very important observation. Um, you said <clears throat> where are the pies? What is going on here? So um, Let's ignore that issue by just writing R here, where R was um, the operator that we defined at the very beginning. And for a second, let's accept that you have a formula like that. I just want to describe what should happen in a case like this. OK, so first of all, you don't have this quotient exactly like this here. You take regular semi-simple elements here with trivial stabilizer. OK, so it's almost the whole group G prime and the whole group G. And then you practically get an equality like this. OK, so for F primes in uh, L2 of G prime, you get an equality like this. For F in L2 of G, you get stuff like this. Um, Right, so what do you want to do now? So this by, uh, who was it? Jacquet, Pietsky, Shapiro, and Shalaika. They showed that this detects uh, the non-vanishing of the Rankin Selberg L function. And now, by the work of Flicker and Rallis, this detects the non vanishing central L value here. I should have said not L function, central L value. Of the, not of the central L value attached to <clears throat> the image of base change. So assuming these two results, the relative trace formula for this choice of groups here gives us the non-vanishing of the L values that we care about, that appear in uh, the GGP conjecture for these groups. OK, so now I want to relate these periods with these L values. So I practically want to relate this formula with this formula. And how you do this is you relate the relative orbital integrals here and here. So practically, the idea is that you want to detect specific vectors uh, f such that the orbital integrals are equal. And for these specific choices of vectors, then you can say that there exists some phi such that this doesn't vanish. And you prove the GGP conjecture. This is pretty much the idea. Uh, but I can write down a little bit more 
explicitly what we mean by this idea. Right, so the idea is that the orbital, okay, how much, okay, maybe I can even be even more precise. Right, so we have, oops, we have an isomorphism, which is when you take the union over, um, isomorphism classes of n-dimensional Hermitian spaces, you get that h of v0, k, g, r, s, where this r, s, I haven't defined what it's, there are elements called regular semi-simple elements, um, k is 0, h is 0. K. This is isomorphic to H1, K, G prime, RS, K, H2, K. For this weird K that I've defined to either be the number field that we started with or the completions. So the, you have this isomorphism locally as well. So now the idea is that the orbital integrals, they are also local in the sense that O delta of F is a product V of O delta phi V and the same for the F prime. When I put prime, I'm talking about the GLN case. When I don't put prime, I'm talking about the unitary case. All right, so what do you want to do? You want so. We want to perform what is called local matching. That means that you take these spaces here and you want to match it with some other object, Fv prime. And we say that they match if Firstly, the orbital integrals are equal, but they won't be exactly equal. Um, they will be equal up to some period. We love that word in number theory, don't we? Um, and it always means not necessarily the same things. Um, for some delta and gamma classes that much, Right, and OV gamma is what is called a local transfer factor, and it has the uh, a specific um, property that we ask it that we want the product of all these local transfer factors to be equal to one. Um, and two you want to create global vectors f and f prime from the local ones right
And the idea is that the first one is what is called smooth transfer. I for every fv there exists some fb prime such that we can pass from one to the other. And this, as we said last time, the GGP conjecture is the theorem now for unitary groups. So for the unitary case, this was proved by Zhang. Oops. Uh, by Zhang for the p-adic places and by Zhu for the Archimedean places. And the second uh, thing you want to show is what is called the fundamental lemma. And practically to ensure that from these local ones you can group them together, what you need to show is that 1 G O V matches with 1 of G prime O V for almost all places V. And this um, was proved by you, Gordon, wait. I need to do this alphabetically. Uh, Bozart Plessis, Gordon, and you. And this is how the GGP conjectures were proved. You can do um, some extra things to actually prove the Ichino Ikeda form, uh, the um, the Ichino Ikeda refinement of the conjectures, but to do that, you use this approach as well. Because, um, again, you relate the periods with the um, Jacques, Pietzky, Shapiro, Shalaika uh, formula that gives you that the periods on the GLN side equal the L values uh, that you care about, up to some factors. Right, so this is what is called the relative trace formula approach and is used in general to prove um, conjectures like GGP. So um, maybe we can do questions and maybe after that I can say a few remarks about the conjectures in general before I wrap it up. So are there any um, questions? So can you maybe, I mean, analyze why this fundamental lemma Sure, this is a difficult question yeah, you're, you're asking. Um, maybe it's not as difficult as I, I think, think it is um, yeah, for experts. Very, yeah. But I, 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 I agree with you, yes. Yeah. To me, it's not. Why does the fundamental lemma imply that you can group everything together? It's, I think. I mean, it's, it's an other condition. It's, uh, because otherwise, there's no way. But yeah. <laughs> but but it seems to me that yeah. this is the hard part. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, the implication follows. But the fundamental lemma took a while to prove. It's, it's, it's called a lemma, but it's not a lemma. And it's fundamental because it's very fundamental, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so it took the work of many people to prove the unitary GGP. Um, and initially, um, the GGP conjectures were stated uh, in the 90s. Um, well, um, by Gross and Prasad, Gan wasn't there yet, um, for orthogonal groups. When we stated them, we stated them for both cases at the same time. But it turns out that the orthogonal case is much harder to prove. Why? Because we haven't proved it yet, I guess. So, um, so some remarks. Um, where is the orthogonal uh, uh, GGP uh, proof uh, standing at the time? at uh, now. So um, for n is equal to 2, this is just Valspouget. For n is equal to 3, this is Ichino's triple <coughs> product formula. For n is equal to 4, um, Gan and Ichino showed it for um, 
have showed it for um, specific cases, so for endoscopic L packets. And for some, I think, stable cases, whatever that means. Um, for n is equal to 5, you also have some results, but they're uh, quite small. Uh, not that they're easy to prove, just that they're, um, they don't really touch the general case. Um, so we have a long way to go. Um, the second remark that I want to make is that there is an even more generalized GGP, where you, you perform pretty much the same idea, but in UN times UM, where N is less than or equal to M. And the group H that you consider is N, uh, sorry, is UN, semi-direct with some unipotent. This is a unipotent. And you might have to twist by some character. Uh, by some small um, automorphic representation, uh, let's call it Xi, which is either a character or the veil representation, depending on specific behaviors of the integers n and m. Um, and this also has an Ichino Ikeda type. formula. Uh, and we actually do have some results here as well, um, <clears throat> which also use the relative trace formula uh, approach. Um, it seems like it's the most fruitful way to uh, prove results like that. Um, and the results that we have for uh, now is that, first of all, Liu suggested that there exists some RTF approach to this. And Zhu used this approach to show it for UN times UN. Cool. Uh, the third remark that I want to make is that I kind of said that already, but it's important to state that we have GGP types conjectures for all classical groups. So symplectic and metaplectic GGP conjectures exist out there, but I won't state them. And the last remark that I want to make, which I definitely don't know much about, but I think it's very, very interesting, is that there is an arithmetic version of the GGP conjectures, which generalize the Gross-Jagger like high pairing of Higner points. So you, you define, let me write what I just said, we have an arithmetic. GGP um, generalizing um, and the idea is that you take, you get some arithmetic now automorphic period, which comes from like the high pairing of some special cycle on your Shimura variety, and then you relate that with the non-vanishing of the first derivative of some uh, of the central value of some derivative. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about this, but um, I read a bit about it, and it seems quite interesting. Um, so yeah, uh, that's all I've prepared for today. Oh. Oh. Uh, some questions or observations, maybe? On the, yeah, maybe I still yeah. a question. Yeah, go on. So, so I, I think I, I might miss something. So, so when you prove the formula, so you started with one function in the Hecke algebra, right? And then what you get is an equality where you sum over all the, the representations, the reducible representations of the L2 space. 
but but when you have these these conjectures you want to pin down the particular representation right Correct. so so how can you pin down the particular representation out of this formula i mean do, do you choose some particular element of your Heke algebra that distinguishes a particular L value of one representation um you th this whole point of the smooth transfer is pinning down the correct vectors that you care about and it's uh, a hard job to see exactly which are the right ones to pick and just the, the existence of the right ones uh, so this is a very good remark what um what needs to be done is non-obvious and non-trivial but, but my point is with the right ones you mean that you only get Instead of getting a whole sum, you only get one particular automorphic representation? Is, is that yes. what you end up getting? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Because if you okay. remember the statement of the conjecture was that there exists some vector phi in P such that we have a non-vanishing of the period, if and only if you get the non-vanishing of the L value. Yes, but, but, but in your formula, you, you get a, a sum of all irreducible representations. And, and the, the, the conjecture is for you fix one pi, particular representation and then you yes, take yes, one but the, this function okay, that in, in has the, a the, distribution so we looked at all the representations <coughs> all together at the exact same time but we started with the phi in l2 right yes and then an f so the and then when we separated the two we looked at them component component and we wanted an equality it's just uh -huh. that the relative trace formula runs through all of them at the same time. So to state it correctly, you have to look at all of them together. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Uh, more questions, observations? Here? For the, no. Maybe the, uh, an idea, or I don't know, maybe it's too difficult also, about this refinement, how, because it seems that the relative trace form just say something non-zero, then some another thing is non-zero, and then you do some kind of... The relative uh, trace formula yeah. practically tells you that you have an equality of the two formulae. Yeah. And because one formula has an equality with a, s a specific things, with L values, that's how you pass through and mm. you get the Ichinokeda refinement. Okay. But okay. in the Ichinokeda refinement, you don't get the Jacques Shapiro thing that I wrote down mm. where practically one thing was equal to L value times the bad prime, so like just the L value. Um, the period was equal to the interpolation. You get extra factors, and those factors come from this passing, mm. where you get all those volumes ah, okay. and the specific orbital integrals and all those extra terms that I haven't written down, mm. but you can actually take care of. Okay. Stuff all all like this that. term appears in the relative trace formula in some way. I mean, yes. Maybe. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay. Uh, more questions, observations? Here. Oh, so, so let thanks again, again, Zenia, for this beautiful mini course. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot for the preparation, and well, everything was very nice.